Okay, if Ed is all ready to go, let me make some formal introductions. So we are very happy to have Ed Swartz from Cornell University. He's going to talk about polymetroids and finite groups. Okay, so I, I wrote in my abstract that um, I'm going to try to convince you that the analogy matroids are to finite fields as polymatroids are to finite groups is not completely crazy. Now that's a pretty low bar, not completely crazy. Um, but my actual goal is to tell you that you should redo anything you've learned about matroids and, fi and finite fields and redo it from the point of view of polymatroids and finite groups. So my secret goal is significantly larger than my stated goal. Um, so uh, let's see here. We got it. All right. So this is joint work uh, with Prairie Wentworth Nice and uh, Alex Yu. Um, uh, Prairie's a graduate student here at Cornell, and Alex is an undergraduate. We begin with Whitney's story, his 1935 paper on uh, introducing matroids. And in that story, he asked the question, um, we have geometric rules of planar graphs. So let me just briefly draw a picture. Hopefully I don't completely mess things up. Just to remind you, if you have a planar graph embedded in the plane, then its geometric dual consists of a vertex for each uh, region that the graph divides the plane into and an edge between each of the regions that the edges divide. So that's the geometric uh, dual. And uh, I will uh, have a tendency, so we, we will call uh, the original graph uh, G. The dual is called G star. And if the edges are A, B, C, D, E, then the edges of the dual graph, we're going to call, so the edge that crosses A, we'll call that A star. The edge that crosses B, we'll call B star, C star, et cetera. All right, that'll set uh, our notation. Um, and so Whitney wanted to know, what is the dual of a non-planar graph? That's what he wanted to know. Or that's one of the things he wanted to know. And his answer was matroids. So what is a matroid? Uh, you, start, you start with a rank function for graphs. So we're going to let E be the edge set of the graph. And for each subset of edges, we define R sub G of A, the rank of A, to be the maximum cardinality of an acyclic subset of edges. Uh, it's a fairly easy exercise in graph theory uh, to show that this is equivalent to the number of vertices minus the number of components of the subgraph consisting of those edges. And there, I want to list four properties of this rank function. One, it's normalized, which is to say the rank of the empty set is zero. It's monotone in the sense that if you have a, if A is a subset of B of edges, obviously the size of the maximum cardinality of an acyclic subset of A is less than or equal to an acyclic subset of B. It's subcardinal in the sense that this rank function is obviously less than the number of edges in A and less obvious and an actual thing you have to prove is that this rank function is something called submodular. So that means that the, if you have two subsets of edges A and B, the sum of their ranks is greater than or equal to the sum of their intersection and union. A matroid is a finite ground set and a rank function on the subset of E satisfying the above four properties. All right. Now, in truth, those who study matroids know that there are somewhere between 50 and 100 equivalent uh, definitions. This is the one we're going to need today. So a uh, matroid is isomorphic. So we use this notation E comma R sub G uh, for some graph G. We're going to call those graphic matroids. They're matroids that come from graphs. OK, the prototypical example of a matroid is from linear algebra. You start with a field. And we have an R by N matrix with coefficients in F. And we allow E, instead of being the, a graph, we'll let it be the columns of our matrix. And for a subset of columns, we let the rank function be the dimension of the column space. That's pretty straightforward. And uh, we'll call these kinds of matroids that come from matrices whose coefficients are in F as being representable over F. So this is, by the way, everything I'm doing right now is in Whitney's original paper. 
And that includes matroid duality, duality. So Whitney's main idea here stems from the following observation. If you start with a planar graph and you let G star be the geometric dual we talked about, well, the rank in that dual graph of the edges corresponding the dual edges for some subset can be computed by looking at this formula, which is the rank in the original graph of the complement of A plus the cardinality of A minus the rank of the whole thing. And so what Whitney did was to say, well, start with arbitrary matroid and just define R star by the same formula. Just define it as the rank of the complement of A plus the cardinality of A minus the rank of the whole thing. And you prove that this is also a matroid. He called it the dual matroid. So our first answer for what is the dual of a non-planar graph is, is this matroid. It's this abstract combinatorial object. Uh, you take the edge set and you have this rank function. Um, and it's given the original, his original formula that you can compute the rank of the geometric dual using this. It's at first sight, at least a reasonable answer, but he did more. Uh, in order to explain what he did, I have to tell you why graphic matroids are representable over every field. So given a graph, so we're going to stop the share for a second. Um, we can associate a matrix as follows. Uh, so we'll stick with this graph. We put the edges on the columns. We put the vertices, I mean, uh, on the rows. We pick a random orientation. It doesn't matter what you pick. Point them any way you want. And then for each one, if you've got a head, so let's nail label the vertices one, two, three, four. So we're going to do A. If you're at a head, you get a one. If you get a tail, you get a minus one. Otherwise, you get a zero. Um, B, you've got a head at two, tail at three, zero, et cetera. Now, one minus one and zero are in every field. So for any field, you can look at this matrix and do, we'll call this thing T, compute the matroid from that. We can compute the matroid from this graph. And the main point here uh, that was, was certainly known before uh, uh, Whitney um, is that the two matroids are the same. They're indistinguishable. So, Every matroid can be represent, every graph can be represented by a field. And then comes an, one, another one of Whitney's results that realizable matroids over some field are closed under duality. The idea here is as follows. Let's so let T be a matrix with coefficients in some field. Let us be a matrix whose row space, it should say, is, is the orthogonal complement, not just is orthogonal, but is the full orthogonal complement to the row space of T. Now, in characteristic zero, everybody knows what the orthogonal complement is. Characteristic not zero, you're probably asking, well, what's the orthogonal complement? Well, use the same inner product. If you have an n tuple of coefficients of things in your field, to take the dot product with another one, you do the same thing. You multiply the corresponding coordinates and add them up. And miraculously, this produces a matrix whose matroid is equal to the dual of your original matrix. It doesn't matter what field it is. So our second answer for what is the dual of a non-planar graph is, it's something realized by a matrix. You take this matrix here, and then you take, you find another matrix whose row space is the orthogonal complement of this, and that represents the dual to your non-planar graph. So what's going to happen today is that we're going to do all this for finite groups, where we're going to start with finite groups and get a dual to some abstract combinatorial object and then get a concrete realization. Before we do that, I want to talk about the matrix when the field is finite. So let's start with a matrix whose coefficients are in some finite field F. Um, I am assuming, by the way, that somebody will interrupt me if there's a problem, question, something's not clear. Um, so the row space is a subspace of the vector space f to the e. Uh, for notation, let's write down f to the e as a, I'm going to write it as a product. Normally, you would write it as a direct sum, but we'll be doing groups soon, so we're going to reuse product. 
um, of the FI. The point here is that, of course, I want to be able to point to coordinates. I want to be able to point to particular coordinates in uh, F to the E. That's the reason for this. Because for a subset of E, a subset of the columns, uh, I want to say F to A is just, just look at those columns, OK? So uh, if I have a three, you know, a three by five matrix, maybe I only want to look at the first four columns. So A would be one, two, three, the, the first four columns. So it only look at the first four coordinates in the row space. And let's let oh, pi sub A be the projection. You know, just remember the coordinates you're interested in. Forget all the others. I'm not doing anything fancy here. What I'm going to observe is that in a finite field, I can compute the dimension by just taking the size of the projection of the row space on those columns. If it's got dimension D, it will have F to the D elements. So I'll just take the log base F of that thing. It's just a different way of computing the dimension of the column space. It's basically, dimension of the column space equals the dimension of the row space. Okay. So I hope that's clear because we're going to use this a lot. Um, it's just a simple numerical calculation that's available to you because the field is finite. And now what we're going to do is exactly the same thing for groups. We're going to start with a, I'm like gamma be a finite group. That's going to play the role of my finite field. E is going to be a finite set. That's going to play the role of my columns in the matrix. I'll let G be gamma to the E. So that's going to be the, going to play the role of the entire potential row space of, of uh, you know, F to the E. Again, we're going to label the various coordinates in G. And we'll let H be a subgroup of this G. The H is going to play the role of the row space. OK? And then I make the same definition. I'll say, well, G to the A, just look at those coordinates that you're interested in for A a subset of E. Uh, we're going to have the projection pi A, same thing. It's the product of all the groups just to the coordinates you're interested in. And define this function, R sub H, so it depends on that subgroup, just as the rank function for the matrix depended on the row space as the log of the cardinality of the group times the cardinality of the projection. Okay, so the definition for finite groups is essentially identical to the definition for finite fields in the row space. Let's now, do- This isn't necessarily an integer, right? Ah, and now we get, so you uh, are, the, uh, you're, 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 let me do the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so a subcardinal polymatroid is a pair where E is a finite ground set. And now our rank function, which everybody assumed went to the integers, now goes to the non-negative reals. So yes, this is usually not an integer. It's quite rare for it to be an integer, right? Um, but it has the same four properties. It's that those four properties that, that, that I wrote down in the beginning, the rank of the empty set is zero, et cetera. That is called a subcardinal polymatroid. I should say, when I first started working with these, I knew they were called polymatroids. I didn't know there was a name for something where the rank of your set was less than or equal to its cardinality. And I, 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 I think I've been listening to the tropical people for too long because I wanted to call them liberal matroids because one, you could liberally think of them as matroids. Uh, two, I was working on them in Ithaca, and we were for many years ranked as the most liberal city in the United States, although we no longer are. And lastly, they're matroids that have been freed from the tyranny of the integers. But it turns out that uh, Lovash has already named these things subcardinal polymatroids, so we'll go with that. Um, you define the dual polymatroid exactly as we did before, the same formula. So our first theorem is that if you do this, you do get a subcardinal polymatroid. Uh, the first three properties, again, are completely trivial and kind of obvious. And you actually have to prove something for the fourth one. Just prove it's submodular. So our first idea of duality of this subgroup H of G is that it's the subcardinal poly polymatroid. Just as Whitney had the dual of a graph with some abstract combinatorial object, this is some abstract polymatroid. 
is the dual of H in G. Uh, let's do, let me just do two quick examples. So one is if, if uh, gamma is Z mod PZ or P is a prime, well, subgroups and subspaces are the same. And so our definition is the usual matroid to any matrix is row space is H. So let's do something non-commutative. So let that G be the symmetric group on three things. Uh, we're just gonna do N equals two. We're gonna have E, so N is the size of E. I'm not sure I wrote that anywhere. And we'll just let the H be the subgroup generated by an involution and a three cycle. And let's just write down the elements. There they are. Um, so if you want to know the rank of E1, the singleton E1, well, there's two things there. So it's log six of two, the rank of just E2 is log six, three, and the rank of the whole thing, which has six distinct elements, is uh, one since the log six of six is one. And if you want to compute the rank of the dual polymatroid, well, you just use that formula and you get those, those are the numbers you get, okay? But it's a, as you can see, it's an extremely simple process to compute this rank function if I give it to you in this nice form. All right, so now remember what uh, Whitney did was to give a concrete realization of the, of the abstract combinatorial object in terms of a matrix. And that's what I wanna do for you now. I want to give you a way of realizing R star of this H. So this is the dual polymatroid. So now I have to torture you with uh, representations of finite groups. So, uh, well, G and H are finite groups. H is a subgroup of uh, G. So we can look at the cosets of left cosets of uh, G mod H, and we make a C vector space of that and make that the basis. Um, G acts on this by left multiplication on the basis extended by linearity. Say what? Well, of course, if you have a left coset, G H, you can multiply it on the left by some other element, G prime, and that gives you another left coset. So there are group X on the basis by permutations. If we were to actually choose this as a basis and make it a matrix, we'd have permutation matrices. So this gives us what's called a permutation representation on this C vector space. And I want to denote the irreducible representations which make up this per permutation representation by psi of each. So that's the collection of irreducible representations repeated, if necessary, with multiplicity of this permutation representation. What I'm going to try to do now for basically the rest of the, for a lot of the rest of the talk, not all of it, but the, a lot of it, is to convince you that psi of H is a concrete realization of R star of H, just as the matrices that Whitney gave us was a concrete realization of the matroid of a non-planar graph. So uh, one of the things we are gonna need to know is that if you're a, um, so this is a, remember G was the product of gamma by itself N times, where N was the cardinality of E. So every row is of the form, uh, row one tensor, et cetera, tensor row N. Uh, this is one of the advantages of using complex coefficients is that you the products have this nice form. Okay. So uh, where each row is an irreducible representation of, of uh, the original group. So let's do, so my first attempt at convincing you that this is a reasonable object will be to look at the simplest case of Z mod PZ. So let's let gamma be Z mod PZ P of prime and let's remember the irreducible representations of Z mod PZ, they're all one dimensional and you can identify it with the integers mod P as follows. Uh, you take an, a T bar an integer mod P and you identify with the one dimensional representation, we'll call it rho sub T, which takes this generator of the cyclic group Z mod PZ to the one by one complex matrix E to the two pi I T over P, right? So this gives us uh, an identification of the irreducible representations of Z mod PZ with the Z mod PZ. And so this, we can, so we can identify the tensor product, rho T1 bar, tensor, et cetera, tensor, rho Tn bar with a n-tuple, 
T1 bar up to Tn bar. Okay. So now my psi of H in this case, whatever it is, it's a bunch of tuples. It's a bunch of n tuples for z mod pz. All right. So let's suppose we start with an R by n matrix with z mod pz coefficients. And let's let R of t be its row space. Of course, we can view that as a subgroup of z mod pz to the n. It was an R by n matrix. So all our rows have n coordinates. So we view it as a subgroup. And the rem remarkable thing is that the n-tuples corresponding to the irreducible representations in psi of r of t, so r of t, remember, is going to be our h, are exactly the row vectors orthogonal to the row space. So we get exactly the same thing as Whitney. Uh, it's, you know, I think most of us would view this as a more complicated way of getting there, uh, but we do get the same thing as uh, Whitney when gamma is z mod pz. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is the, how does this thing relate to the characteristic polynomial of a matroid? So the characteristic polynomial of a, of a matroid is, might be the most well-known invariant of matroids. Um, it's a special case of the Tut polynomial, so maybe that should be voted as the most well-known, I'm not sure. So normally the characteristic polynomial is defined in terms of the Mobius function of the lattice of flats, whatever that is, if you don't do matroids. Here we're gonna give a much simpler definition to write down, which may not be the same as to work with. Um, it's uh, this, just this formula. You take all the subsets of your ground set E and you form the polynomial given by minus one to the cardinality of that subset times the variable raised to the rank of the whole set minus the rank of your subset. So that difference there is usually called the co-rank of A. So, I mean, it's just obviously it's some polynomial with integer coefficients of your, of your matroid. It has zillions of applications. In fact, it's, you know, one of the main successes of matroids is that this thing has so many applications, far more than seems reasonable given the formula. Um, for poly matroids, we're gonna use exactly the same definition. I'm gonna call it the characteristic. Now, of course we have to put polynomial in quotes because the thing's not a polynomial. The rank of E minus the rank of A is hardly an integer. I should say, um, so I have since learned that things of the form lambda to a non-negative real number are called power functions. No one's been able to tell me what you call a finite linear combinations of power functions or you know, integer linear combinations of power functions. I, I don't know what they're called. No one's told me yet. If somebody knows, it'd be nice to know. I'm gonna keep calling it a polynomial because I'm lazy, but uh, it's not. But it is a perfectly good function. So let me tell you about um, one of the most uh, well-known results in matroid theory involving the characteristic polynomial. It's certainly the, sort of the grandfather of uh, eight gazillion other results. If you start with a finite field and an R by N matrix with coefficients in that finite field, so let E R sub T be that associated matroid. Um, the theorem says that the number of row vectors in the row space of T, which do not contain a zero. So you know, these row vectors are a bunch of coordinates, uh, is in fact the characteristic polynomial of that matroid evaluated at the cardinality of the field. All right. Now, this means that, of course, this quantity, the number of row vectors which do not contain a zero, is a matroid invariant. Two different matrices, with, which don't really have anything to do with one another, but are the same matroid, will have the same number of uh, row vectors, which do not contain a zero. Now, this theorem is normal. This is called the critical theorem of Crapo and Rota. It's normally stated in a different way. I will tell you that this thing, what I've written down here, is equivalent to it. It's just an easier way of stating what I want to state in a, in a couple of minutes. Those familiar with this know that there's actually more to this theorem. Uh, you can describe what the characteristic polynomial is at any integer power of the cardinality of f. Um, there is a similar theorem here, but I'm not going to give it, but it's, the, it's completely analogous. What I want to give here is this theorem. 
that, that, that doesn't seem do right. Like, question. shouldn't, sorry, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but shouldn't all uh, matrices with that with uh, linearly independent columns give rise to the same matroid? Uh, yes. Well, I, I mean, like, it's definitely possible to come up with uh, like a bunch of linearly independent columns with no zeros in the matrix, but you can oh, also have row space, not just the matrix. Oh, the row. Oh, we're in a finite field. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All row it. space. I see. That's right. You're right. You can definitely do that. That's why you need the whole row space. Yeah. I was just, I, I saw a number of row vectors and assumed that we were talking about the, the matrix itself and not the space. That's right. No, you got to look at the whole row space. Otherwise, your complaint is quite valid. So in order to state the analogous theorem for finite groups, I just need a couple of definitions. So if you have something in our, remember H is a subgroup of gamma to the N. So for Z mod PZ, the identity is zero. So instead of counting zeros in an arbitrary group, we're gonna count the number of things, the number of coordinates that have the identity of the group. This one sub gamma is the identity of the group. Okay, so for this to find the ID of H is all of the coordinates where you have the identity. And for one of these representations, I wanted to find triv or trivial of rho to be all the coordinates in your tensor product decomposition where it's the trivial representation. Um, notice that in Z mod PZ, when we identify irreducible representations with n tuples from Z mod PZ, it's the positions of the zeros in the corresponding n tuple. Okay, so for finite groups, we get essentially the same theorem. The number of H's in that H, which was the row space, such that nobody has the identity, is equal to the characteristic polynomial evaluated at the cardinality of the group. Remember the group uh, is sitting in for the finite field. And this is part of my justification for calling psi of H the dual. If you look at the characteristic polynomial of the dual polymatroid evaluated at the cardinality of the group, that's the sum over all the rows which have no trivial part in their tensor product decomposition, which now I can't just count them. I have to add their dimensions because some of them have uh, higher dimensions <laughs> than one. So I need to add their dimensions in order to make this uh, statement. Um, Okay, so this is a great book for uh, finite groups. I should say there is a variation for um, uh, gamma to the n, which uh, is very analogous to the variation for the finite field, the cardinality of the finite field to the n. Um, so this part here, these two theorems are great book for finite groups. Actually, for finite abelian groups, is extremely closely related. And my guess is either is either equivalent or could be easily derived from for some uh, older papers by Kung Rota Murti and another paper by Brini, um, where the idea of thinking about things from the representation theoretic point of view is in the air. Um, and they get evaluations of the characteristic polynomial for things involving finite abelian groups. They don't mention anything about non-abelian groups um, at all. And I don't think they actually state these two theorems, although I think it follows very easily from what they're doing. I should say that they really didn't want to give up the integers. So instead of looking at lambda to the rank minus the rank, they introduced uh, a separate function so that they could avoid having non-integer polynomials. Uh, the second theorem, the one involving the dual, actually has a topological realization and significant extension involving certain quotient spaces in the combinatorial Laplacian. So that's what I'm going to torture you with next. Um, so I want you to think of gamma as a finite group, as a zero-dimensional simplicial complex, as a bunch of distinct vertices. And then we're going to take the join, we'll call it x, of uh, gamma with itself n times. So if you don't know what the join is, it's a simplicial complex whose maximal faces, known as facets, are just, in this case, I think it's my next line, 
Uh, okay, so the vertices are the form uh, gamma sub i, so gamma is some element of our group, and the subscript refers to which copy of gamma of our n copies it lies in, and the facets are just n tuples of gamma. So if you're unfamiliar with join, just imagine a simplicial complex where you have all these vertices coming from gamma, and you form a face by choosing one element of gamma from each of the n copies. So uh, in particular, all of the vertices in one coordinate never have an edge between them. If you think of the one-dimensional skeleton, that's the complete multipartite graph on the cardinality of n repeated n, cardinality of gamma repeated n times. So, but another way to think about this is that the facets are just elements of that group G before, which was gamma to the n. All right, G acts on x coordinate wise. Now I'm gonna have it act on the right for reasons that'll be clear in a moment. Um, so for a vertex gamma sub i, so that's some element gamma in the group gamma in the ith coordinate. If you multiply it by, so I've called the vertices Greek gammas and the elements of the group Latin Gs, even though they're the same objects, okay? Um, we'll, multiply, we'll, we'll, we'll multiply it by sticking it on the right and its inverse. We, you know, when you do group theory, you have to, if you're gonna start putting things on the right, you gotta start using inverse if you want it to be an actual group action. And the point here is that when I take this quotient space, remember we have this H sitting in the background, so it's some subgroup of G. When we take that quotient space, the facets of XH are the left cosets of of the form GH. Uh, I should say that the choice of left or right is, is completely arbitrary and is strictly fun, uh, driven by the fact that I was reviewing my representation theory about reading Serre and that's what he does. So there's nothing special about right or left. You can reverse everybody if you want to. So our facets of this are the left cosets that we met earlier. But these quotients are, they're a little hard to understand, I think. So let me do the simplest one possible, gamma equal to z mod two z. And let's think about the big space X. So Z mod two Z joined with itself N times. I'm telling you that that's isometric to the boundary of a cross polytope. So why is that? Maybe I should stop, oops. Okay. Um, maybe I should draw one picture here on the board. Well, the join of Z mod 2Z with itself, so here's, here's my copies, let's do three. So here N equals three, and these are three copies of Z mod 2Z. So how, what are the, fa the facets are, you're supposed to pick one from each one. So you're, the facets are of the form of pick one of these, pick one of these, pick one of these. Well, what do you do on the cross polytope in R3? You pick one vertex from E plus or E minus where E1 plus or E1 minus where E1 is the first coordinate vector. One vertex from E2 plus and E2 minus where that's second coordinate vector and one from E3 plus and E3 minus. So the big space is easy to picture. It's just the boundary of a cross polytope. Um, now the quotient spaces are another matter. Um, these G's, so the elements of our group act by flipping. If you think of it through the cross polytope, the convex hull of the unit coordinate vectors, E1 up to EN, it flips them if, G, so there's only two possibilities, uh, zero and one, and it flips them if it's not zero. Let's do the one example you probably might be familiar with. If H is just the simple identity of the whole group, so that's all zeros, and minus identity, all ones. Well, then you're flipping all of the vertices. It's the antipodal map and the quotient is real projective space. Now that's a pretty nice space, real projective space, and just basically doesn't have anything to do with what these quotients look, usually look like. In general, it's very singular, um, all kinds of singularities. It's not a manifold in any reasonable sense. It's not a manifold with boundary usually. It can be, but it's very rare. And the quotient is actually usually what's called a simplicial poset, not a simplicial complex. 
Um, again, I'm going to turn off the sharing for a second. So what is a simplicial post set? Well, let me one example. We'll, we'll do this. Let's do this for n equals 2. So here's the boundary of my cross polytope. And we'll let um, h be the subgroup just one and the identity. So I'm just, it's just the antipodal map. Here's E1, here's E1 minus, here's E2 plus, here's E2 minus the quotient space. Well, both of the pairs of vertices get identified and for the edges become two, it looks like this. So this is E1, both plus and minus, this is E2 plus and minus. You end up with two edges. This one, one of them co corresponds to this pair and the other one corresponds to that pair. So what you got is a simplicial complex, well, but you'll have more than one face per set of vertices. Now these things go under by about 27 different names. I'm, I don't really know how many different names these things go under. Uh, this is the combinatorics seminar. In this world, simplicial post set is the most common one, probably. Uh, so we'll go with that. Mm -hmm. So, you're imagining some kind of simplicial complex, but with many faces for each set of vertices. So now I have to describe for you the combinatorial Laplacian. And uh, so we're going to start with a finite simplicial post set. Um, the combinatorial Laplacian can be done in much more general terms, but we have no need for that here. And we'll let uh, CI sub Y be the I chains of Y. And we're still using complex coefficients here. And we'll let uh, you know partial i be the usual boundary operator. So we know what that is, I hope. Uh, we will be considering the empty set as a minus one dimensional face. And we will define something called delta sub i, which maps um, i chains to i chains by this formula. So TR stands for transpose. So it's the composition of first, the first term is first go down to the I minus one chains and then come back up via the transpose. So that maps I chains to I chains. And similarly, the second term is, you know, go up by the transpose to I plus one chains and then come back down. All right, so this thing is called the combinatorial Laplacian. Uh, why is it called that? Let's see. Um, all right, so first of all, it's symmetric because it's a sum of symmetric things. So it has non-negative real eigenvalues. That's always a nice thing. Um, there's something called the Hodge theorem which says that if you take the cohomology of our simplicial post at Y in dimension I, it's actually isomorphic in a, in a canonical way, actually, to the kernel of delta I. So these combinatorial Laplacians actually compute homology with respect to the complexes. And the real reason I got this name is because it's possible to approximate the smooth Laplacian in Ramanian geometry can be approximated by using triangulations of the manifold and these delta i. And you can't use any triangulations, you have to use uh, special ones that are related to the geometry of the space. But this is why it's called the combinatorial Laplacian the two facts we want to actually remember here are that there's non-negative real eigenvalues and that Hodge theorem that we can compute cohomology by taking the kernel of this thing. All right, so I want to tell you, my, my goal here is I'm going to tell you a theorem for binary matroids. Binary matroids are matroids representable over the field of cardinality two. So it's, uh, and then show how that applies to arbitrary groups. So I'm going to let H be a subgroup of z mod 2z to the n. So E comma RH is a binary matroid. Uh, how is that? Why is that true? Well, you take any matrix whose row space is H that the matroid of that matrix as we defined uh, matroids associated to matrices will be the same as the well, it's a poly matroid, but here it's an actual matroid uh, defined with this H, this row space. And let's denote by H star, the thing that Whitney told us about, uh, the subspace of vectors orthogonal to H. 
in z mod 2z to the n. So it's the entire orthogonal complement, although it's weird to call it a complement since it may contain some of its own vectors. The intersection is not necessarily the zero space. Um, and we have the following theorem. This was sort of the start of this subject. In 2018, uh, Alex Ju proved that if you have, if, if this row vector is not part of your row space, so what is this row vector? This row vector is, is all zeros, except in one coordinate, it's got the non-zero element of Z mod 2Z. For those who are familiar with matroids, that is saying that the matroid does not contain any co-loops. For those not familiar with matroids, you should ignore that sentence and just go with, there's no rows of that sort. Then each row in this H star contributes an eigenvalue equal to twice the number of zeros in the top dimensional combinatorial Laplacian. Uh, if it is in H, uh, then lambda is an eigenvalue of this quotient space if and only if lambda minus one is an eigenvalue of, what is that thing? Well, I want you to take, do this quotient space and just forget about the ith coordinate. That's what that's supposed to mean. Take the ith coordinate away from G, take the ith coordinate from H, take the ith coordinate away from the join. The, if you're familiar with the combinatorial Poisson, it looks suspiciously as if I just added a cone point because that's what, because adding a cone point adds one to all your eigenvalues and that's because that's exactly what happened. That's what the co-loop does is it makes you a cone of everything except the co-loop. So now let's talk about the general case it's gonna be exactly the same. So it used to be twice the number of zeros. So here, instead of eliminating all zeros and a one, here I'm gonna eliminate all the identity element and a non-identity element. Suppose that's not in my subgroup. Then each row in that psi of H, which was supposed to be represent our dual space, contributes an eigenvalue of the cardinality of the group. Last time that was two times the cardinality of the number of trivial representations. Last time that was the number of zeros. And again, we have to consider the dimension of the representation. So it's, the eigenvalue has multiplicity, this. If there is an element of this form, then there is a induction argument that allows you to make, to look at something similar that's smaller dimensional so that all the eigenvalues of the top dimension are in fact integers. Uh, I should say that several authors have studied complexes where the combinatorial Laplacian has integer eigenvalues. I don't know if this is all of them. These are the ones I know. There could well be more. Um, I tried to do them in a chronological order. Hamlin and Friedman looked at chessboard complexes. Cook, Reiner, and Standen did independence complexes of matroids. Dong and Wachs looked at matching complexes, and Duval and Reiner did shifted complexes. Uh, I should say that um, this whole project stems from a mistake I made about 20 years ago. The Cook Reiner Standard article came out at about the same time as my thesis. I was looking at these quotient spaces for Z mod 2Z. They had integer eigenvalues. I was like, ah, I wonder what happens in my spaces. I wonder if they're integers. I knew some of them were. I started doing them, and oh, well, lo and behold, there I was getting integers all the time. And then one day while sitting in a seminar like this one, not having a clue as to what the speaker was talking about, like some of you are experiencing right now, I was just working out an example, writing these big matrices, doing it by hand. And I went back after the seminar and put in the computer and got non-integers. Did it again, got non-integers again. Didn't think anything of it. I said, okay, I'm not going there. I'm not trying to figure out what's going on. And then uh, a little over two years ago, I was working with some uh, another undergraduate on the combinatorial Laplacian, and I don't know why, but it suddenly dawns on me as I'm explaining it to him that these matrices are symmetric and they have non-negative real eigenvalues. Hey, the computer gave me eigenvalues that were clearly complex, not like 0.00001i, which could be some kind of numerical computation of things, but things like, you know, 3.67 plus 24.8i. Obviously, I did not put in a symmetric matrix and had made a mistake. So I gave this problem as are there integer eigenvalues to, to Zhu. And that's how this whole thing started. Um, let me, I'm going to speed ahead here. 
Um, let me say that the, if you know what minors of matroids are, polymatroids representable over gamma, so that would be any polymatroid you can get as R sub H or some H, where the original group is gamma, are closed under minors. Um, let's uh, go to, oh, okay. Um, I want to give, I says one last thought, I want to give you two last thoughts. It turns out that basically all of the concepts of matroid theory, except for the various connections between circuits uh, and hyperplanes and all these cryptomorphisms, there are flats, um, but all these questions of like representability, coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, what, how do they behave? Uh, points, lines, planes theorem, which conjecture, which we just had a archive solution posted to. All of these problems can be put, now be stated for finite groups in one form or another. So normally, you know, what you do at the end of the talk is you list future problems, but my future problems is the list of 80 years of matroid theory or 85 years of matroid theory uh, for finite fields. So I, I'm not going to list those problems. I am going to give you one last thought though. Uh, and that is that there is a similar relationship between connected Lie groups and submodular polynomial polymatroids with rational rank functions. And I think we will stop there. Let's thank Ad for the beautiful talk. Now, any additional questions to add? Yeah. Well, maybe let me ask a question. So can you see all those results about integer eigenvalues as a consequences of your theorem? Say again? Can you see all those results about integer eigenvalues as a as consequences of your result? Uh, um, so there's a connection between the crapo roto theorem and the integer eigenvalues, but um, what's really going on for the integer eigenvalues is that there's a much more general theorem for integer eigenvalues. You can actually take any finite group, take G, let's call it gamma, and take gamma sets x1 through xn, take the join of x1 through xn, let g act on it in sort of the, uh, gamma act on it in the obvious way. And you will always get integer eigenvalues on that space. So this is actually a special case of, of that. Um, yeah, so the people who want to know why do certain complexes have integer eigenvalues, in one sense, this throws a major monkey wrench into the thing in that it's a huge cl new class. Another thing, it, I, you know, it's simplicial post sets, not simplicial complexes. So maybe it doesn't really have any impact on that line of research. Um, but uh, the, the integer eigenvalues um, led us to another one. Uh, if you know uh, Green's theorem on the weighted numerator of a linear code and the Tut polynomial, that theorem goes over verbatim in this setting. You define the top polynomial with the same formula. You count on your subgroup H for each one. You count the number of coordinates that are not the identity. And now you, by a miracle, the thing spits out the, and you have Green's crazy formula, which I can't repeat. I don't know if I, um, spits out this right answer. Uh -huh. um, we have done several other things, which I, which I skipped over. We know which groups, so you can ask, so like, you know, you know, Tut's famous theorem on uh, matroids and graphs, right? The, uh, a, a, the, the dual matroid of a graph is graphic if and only if it's planar. That's, you know, Tut's theorem. There's a th theorem like that here too. Let's call a group uh, closed under duality if for any subgroup H, there is another subgroup H star whose rank function is the dual rank function. And it turns out that that happens only if gamma was a billion. So a billion, finite billion groups play the role of planar graphs. Um, 
I also have a question. Yeah. How crucial do you think the finiteness of your group um, assumption is? Of course, I understand the, you want to take logarithm of the size, but there well, are, there are analogs of these things uh, for infinite groups too. That's right. So the answer is, I don't know. For, I mean, for Lie groups here, there's something you can do that's fairly obvious. Um, but for, you know, you want to start looking at, you know, finally presented groups or something like that, right? But I mean, so I can tell you just some food for thought. If you have Z, you can uh -huh. ask what's, um, uh, what's the size of Z. Uh -huh. um, you can add one per element, but you can also add E to the uh, negative um, absolute value of N squared. Yeah. element and then add over that you get a finite number logarithm of that you are already working with real numbers anyway uh -huh. <laughs> logarithm of that is another real number which captures the size of z and if you do like subgroups of z you get some smaller number so it has some sort of formal inequalities that you're looking for and i suspect i mean your your work is rather formal i suspect if you just come up with <laughs> these kind of functions it should go through i would not be surprised i don't think we're within a hundred miles of the most general case. I don't think we're anywhere near it. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I think that, uh, yeah, I think this is an entirely new direction. That's, you know, I, I can't, I can't begin to guess what the most general thing is. Um, I, the only thing I thought about is lead, is lead groups and I haven't thought much about that. Okay, I have a specific question there. I wonder to address at some point, but you know, this was all driven originally by questions um, as opposed to, you know, we weren't trying to find a generalization to finite groups. It just sort of happened. Uh, when, when, when Alex was showing me his proof for z one 2 z I was just sitting there going like, you know, this is gonna work for any group, isn't it? <laughs> And then I started asking him and, and for her to start proving stuff about any group. <laughs> I, 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 did somebody else? So is there a, um, a geometric understanding for what contraction means here? If you think of contraction- oh, Well, it's, it's, it's a simple, contraction is, is simple. Um, let me do contraction for you on the, the row space first. How do you do contraction on the row space uh, or on the matrix? One of the ways to do it is you look at the uh, row space and you say, okay, find me all the rows that are zero on the set I'm trying to contract, right? I mean, if you do a singleton, it's a little easier to see, yeah. uh, you know, all right. And then just, cro hey, just take that row subspace and cross off the coordinates. That you don't want. Same thing here. Exactly okay, so the that same. Pushes forward in the same way that. Yeah, it's 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 identical. There's a a lot that's identical. The only thing that's really hopeless, well, not hopeless. I haven't tried. Is you know what's a circuit? A flat is easy, uh, and there's a Mobius function, and it does what it's supposed to do, mm -hmm. except that its value is. Um, you know, the rank function associated to the post set of flats is not so much the same as the rank function I'm using. Um, so one uh, curiosity of this is that you could ask, if I have a non-abelian group, what matroids can I get by doing this? And the answer is nothing, almost. You can get every matroid whose simplification is the Boolean algebra. Okay, and nothing else. However, if you ask me what lattices of flats can you get? Ah, now I can get not only all matroid possible, anything realizable, I can also get non-realizable things. I can get the Fano direct sum the non-Fano. I can get the geometric, that geometric lattice of that matroid. Um, using just uh, S3 or Z mod 60. So the representability questions are kind of, you know, and also, and of course, I didn't mention the fact that polymatroids are being studied from the point of view of polyhedrons now, generalized permutahedrons, all kinds of geometric invariants. Well, they've got to have some kind of meaning on the groups. 
for those pony matrix. I, I don't know anything about that at all. Uh, I, I wanted to ask something like that. Can you get much more combinatorial equivalents of poly of, of poly matrix? So, so you but have asking, these, like, these um, generalized okay, reasons. Hear you have you cannot hear me? You can uh, now you I can. You have this generalized free tetrahedra, and uh, I was wondering if you can get more combinatorial types of polytopes. Or uh, um, no, these are well. All of these are generalized permutahedra. And uh, yeah. uh, Marcelo just but you're increasing matroids, right? And matroid polytopes are a very very special kind of generalized. That's right. So you get you get uh, you you don't get very many matroids unless well, if you start using um, you know, uh, you can get all matroid polytopes. That's easy. That are that are coming from realizable matroids. Mm -hmm. That's easy because you just use this subspace. You know, you <laughs> you forget it's a subspace. You just pretend it's a subgroup uh, of the row space of your representing matrix. Um, and you can get a lot of other things. I don't know what kinds of things you can get. Like, can you get the permutahedron? I don't know. How about other Coxeter matroids? Or, or any other Coxeter matroids? I don't know which ones you can get and which ones you cannot. No, no one's tried, as far as I know. Why well, I had someone trying the permutahedron itself, but that was about it. Um, okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah. So, is there any possible way you could get these um, these uh, subcardinal polymatroids with uh, non-integer uh, rank functions by approximating uh, somehow from so from subcardinal poly polymatroids with integer uh, or with rational rank functions? Well, okay, so my first answer is I don't know. Um, I know this though, if you use, well, I mean, as a general question, the answer is the answer is going to be yes. I mean, if you just do polymatroids, forget about the groups. Okay. Right, don't, okay, well, by, don't, some don't, by some interesting. Right, if you, if you just forget about the, the groups, then the answer is almost certainly yes. I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. I, could end up being wrong, but <laughs> it's because uh, there are some equalities as opposed to open conditions. There are some open closed conditions as opposed to open conditions. Um, so maybe it can't be done. Uh, it may be some of the, uh, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the, if you use, but, but think about this, if you, if you do study P groups, okay, you're gonna get rational ones and you know, People study groups by studying their CELO P subgroups. Um, I don't know if there's any connection there or not. Um, but the answer to your question is I, I, pretty much I don't know. Which pretty much covers everything about this subject at the moment. Because this, <laughs> I mean, so one, one thing is, you know, we don't have a preprint yet. I've started writing up some notes just to see if we're right, you know, just to have. <laughs> <laughs> just, just so, just so we can make sure you know. A lot of times you start writing stuff down and you're like, "Oops," <laughs> um, and that hasn't happened. Um, but uh, I mean, we don't have a preprint, and I'm not sure. I, 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 in some sense, I feel compelled to get one out by December, uh, mostly because Alex is applying to graduate school. It'd be nice if he could just point to it. Um, although he has other things. Uh, but uh, you know, where do you stop? When, at what point do we, say, <laughs> it's like I said, you know, I can just pick a random subject of matroid theory and ask about it. There's a reasonable chance we'll have a reasonable answer. Um, Any more questions? Then how about we thank Ed again and people can stay for a while and continue chatting, but those who cannot stay can leave. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Let me...